I'm John Strum, and this is Real Talk MS. It's September 21st, and we have a lot to talk about. And believe it or not, Real Talk MS is four years old today. In 2017, some 212 episodes ago, I launched this podcast, hoping to share the sense of hope and feeling of encouragement that I was experiencing at that time. I was two years into my term as one of three lay members of the International Progressive MS Alliance Scientific Steering Committee. And as I continued to learn about some of the amazing MS research that was taking place And as I came to know some of the top MS research scientists and clinicians in the world and got a clear sense of their personal passion and professional commitment to solving multiple sclerosis, I found myself feeling really encouraged about the future for people affected by MS. I also realized that during our Scientific Steering Committee meetings that I was the only layperson from North America in the room. And I thought that if I could share some of the science, but but in plain English so it would be easy to understand, well, then others might feel as encouraged about the future as I was. So first I thought about writing a blog, but I realized that some people living with MS who were dealing with vision issues, people like my wife, wouldn't be able to read that blog, and others might even face challenges using a mouse or a keyboard to navigate a blog. That's when I thought that a podcast might work. I thought it would be more accessible, and I liked the idea that a podcast was portable. I listened to podcasts when I was driving, and I had friends who listened to podcasts at the gym, but I had no idea about what went into producing a podcast. So I gave myself three months to figure things out, get the mic, buy the software, come up with a name for the podcast, build a website, all the things that had to get done if I was going to do this. Then I launched, and I had absolutely no idea of where we'd be four years later. And I say we because I didn't know who would find the podcast or how useful they might find it. And then you guys started showing up, and you've continued to keep coming back to Real Talk MS and listening. What I love most about Real Talk MS is the community of listeners that we've built. So I hope you'll share this four-year birthday with me today because it's been as much your doing as it's been mine. This is our podcast, and if I haven't said it in a while, I'll say it today. Thanks for joining and continuing the Real Talk MS conversation. I know you're pretty used to hearing me say that we have a lot to talk about, but today that is definitely the case. There are a lot of great events coming up that I want to make sure you get on your calendar. You're going to meet another difference maker in our community. And we're going to be talking with Dr. Herb Karpatkin and Cinda Hugos about rehabilitation specifically aimed at improving minimal walking difficulties that you might experience early on in your MS journey, as well as advanced walking difficulties that some of you might experience if you're living with progressive MS. The good news is that no matter where you might be in your MS journey, you'll be able to benefit from the rehabilitation strategies that Herb and Cinda are going to share with us today. But before we get to my conversation with Herb Karpatkin and Cinda Hugos, there are a few other things that you should know about. As I mentioned just a moment ago, there are some outstanding virtual events coming up, and beginning tomorrow, September 22nd, the National MS Society is hosting the Black MS Experience Summit. Being black with MS carries unique challenges and experiences, from scientific and clinical differences in the disease itself, to facing inequities in the healthcare system, and more. The Black MS Experience is an opportunity to connect with others who understand the distinct experience of living with MS as a black person. To learn more and register for this two-day virtual event, you can visit nationalmssociety.org slash blackmsexperience, and you'll find that link in today's show notes. I also want to remind you that this Thursday, episode number two of the MS Caregiver Conundrum goes live. 
I think most of you know that I spent more than 20 years as a caregiver for my wife, Jean, who lived with a particularly difficult case of progressive MS. So as you might imagine, this special eight-episode podcast series that focuses on MS caregivers is particularly close to my heart. In the MS caregiver conundrum, you'll meet some amazing MS caregivers, some who are caring for a partner, some who are caring for a child who's been diagnosed with pediatric MS, some adult children who are caring for a parent with MS, and you'll also learn about some of the challenges that MS caregivers face. You'll hear about what I consider to be amazing resources that are available to MS caregivers, and because it's me and I'm an MS activist, you'll even hear about the public policy issues that impact caregivers, as well as the state and federal legislation designed to support MS caregivers. As I hope you've come to expect on Real Talk MS, you'll hear all of this directly from the experts. Former First Lady Rosalind Carter said there were only four kinds of people in the world. Those who have been caregivers, those who are currently caregivers, those who will be caregivers, and those who will need a caregiver. So if you happen to see yourself in one of these four groups, I hope you'll check out this special eight-episode podcast series. Episode one is already available, and episode two premieres Thursday, September 23rd. You can find the MS Caregiver Conundrum at mscaregiverconundrum.com, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, or wherever you find your favorite podcasts. And finally, we're about 10 days away from a big virtual event. In fact, it's called Big October. And Big October 2021 is a month-long series of events that are specifically for people affected by MS. There are experts delivering research and wellness presentations. There's an MS Community Expo, a wellness challenge, and you can participate in all of this at no cost from the comfort and safety of your own home. Big October is something that I really look forward to, and in a moment, we'll meet the driving force behind Big October, the founder and president of MS Hope for a Cure, and a true difference maker in the MS community, E.J. Levy. My guest, E.J. Levy, was diagnosed with secondary progressive MS in 2002, and in 2007, she founded MS Hope for a Cure, a 501c3 charitable organization that describes itself as dedicated to raising funds that could make the biggest difference in the shortest amount of time in the fight against multiple sclerosis. And since its founding, MS Hope for a Cure has raised more than $10 million toward that effort. EJ and I first met at an International Progressive MS Alliance Scientific Congress. And I think it's worth mentioning that MS Hope for a Cure was the very first trust and foundation member of the Alliance. Well, MS Hope for a Cure has a major virtual event coming up that I hope you put on your calendars and plan on attending. EJ is a friend of the podcast, and she's back today to tell us about Big October 2021. Each year, MS Hope for a Cure hosts MS Hope Day, an in-person, day-long symposium. And last year, MS Hope Day transitioned into Big October, a month-long virtual event. Well, this year, Big October is returning. It's still a virtual event, and it's fair to say that it's bigger and better than ever. EJ, I know you've got a lot planned for Big October 2021. I see you have live research or wellness presentations scheduled for every Sunday throughout the month. Can you tell us about those? I think these are some of my uh, favorite uh, presentations that we've ever had, and you know, we've been doing this for a long time. I always try to find kind of the most interesting or things as someone living with MS that I would want to know when I uh, schedule our speakers. Uh, so every Sunday in October, starting with Sunday, October 4th, um, most of the time, 11 a.m. Eastern time, um, you can uh, tune in and listen to our talks. Uh, we are actually kicking off our first Sunday with uh Dr. Brooks Wingo. And 
we're using her because she's going to help us kick off our wellness challenge, which I'm sure you'll be asking me about shortly. But she has done um, research on adherence to lifestyle changes. So uh, she's working specifically right now with wellness being such a, a hot topic with MS, um, diet and exercise in particular. She is looking at research on how do we get people to stick to a new way of eating um, or how do we get people to do a certain amount of exercise, especially for trials. If we want to be able to prove that one diet is better than another, during a trial, we have to have people that are committed to eating a certain way for that certain amount of time. So um, she's researching on how we can help people do that so that we can have some real uh, scientific based evidence on how diet and exercise uh, affect MS. So she's our first speaker and we're super excited to have her. Um, and then I'll just quickly highlight a couple of other speakers. We have a really interesting panel on October 10th um, featuring four clinicians who are going to talk about challenges with progressive MS clinical trials, the history, um, and then focus on um, the need for equitable uh, representation in clinical trials, which is kind of also a hot topic. Uh, then on October 17th, we have a great interview um, with uh, our researcher, Al Alessandro Dadana, is a researcher. MS Hope is uh, funding his research. And then we're concluding on the last Sunday, October 24th, with uh, everyone knows our favorite uh, Dr. Tim Kutze of the MS Society, who's going to bring us an update from Ectrums 2021 that's happening in October. So that might be more than you wanted to know about our Sunday presentations, but I'm excited about all of them. So I had to mention them. I'm glad that you did. And yes, I definitely want to circle back to this wellness challenge in a moment. But I also wanted to ask you about the MS Community Expo that people could visit. What can they expect to find in the expo? So, you know, lots of times you go to an in-person event and you'll see uh, your pharma tables and they'll have their little tchotchkes out where you'll see a few other things. And it's nice to walk around, but I always felt that if we were going to bring people together for an expo, it should be an opportunity to learn. So every one of our 45 plus tables this year, our exhibitors will have some um, sort of educational topic um, that will hopefully bring new and interesting information to you. Um, we have uh, people talking about, actually we just spoke to someone today who's, I'm going to be highlighting music therapy for people with MS. Uh, we have uh, people focusing on spasticity uh, and diet. So every single table will have a, a slightly different uh, bunch of information. Um, one of the best things about the MS Community Expo, and I call that, is this year we have MS Hope and nine other MS organizations having tables, including your very own Real Talk MS. Uh, I find that we have so many different MS organizations and they're all terrific, but sometimes we don't know where to go for what. So hopefully having 10 organizations in the same area where you can pop from table to table will help people really understand what resources are where. And if they have a problem or a need, maybe what organization is the best one to reach out to. And I'll just add that I was thrilled to be invited to be a part of this and, and really look forward to having people meet the podcast and meeting some of the people who listen. So thank you for that. And now let, let's talk about this whole new dimension to Big October that you've added. What is the Wellness Challenge all about? Well, the Wellness Challenge is kind of an answer to last year's Big October, where we had um, people coming Sundays and some people stopping by to look at the different uh, expo participants during the week. But we wanted to have something to really engage the community throughout the month. And maybe it didn't need to be this engaging, um, but we have put together um, over 15 different instructors, wellness instructors, um, including nutritionists and people who specialize in mindfulness and meditation um, and just all different kinds of exercise, yoga, Pilates, um, all of the focus on MS. Um, and they will be, we will be offering four classes a day, Monday through Friday. Um, 
and let me just say this, everything is free. We want to make sure everybody knows that this is a great opportunity to, uh, to do this without having any cost. Um, and the reason we're calling it a challenge and not just saying, here we go, we've got all these classes, is that we're going to challenge you, um, people living with MS, your family and friends, um, the staff at the MS centers. We want everybody to participate. Anybody who's interested in kind of making a change uh, to, to participate in the wellness challenge, I'm going to do it. Maybe, John, you'll do it too. Um, and at the beginning of each week, um, you'll see the classes, the the exercise classes that are available for that week. And you'll go in and you'll register for them. You'll click on the ones you want to take. Then you'll also see a, uh, a list of 15 nutritional goals. And these aren't diets. These are more like things like drink eight glasses of water or eat a piece of fruit with every meal or stop eating after seven o'clock. And uh, you'll pick the nutritional goals you want to uh, strive for for that week. And then you're also going to see a list of about 25 different webinars, all on different wellness topics. And maybe you'll say, oh, my goal is to listen to these two. I've always wanted to learn about that. So you pick what you want to do. And then at the end of the week, you look back and you see, did I accomplish my goal? I challenged myself to do this. And did I do it? And if you meet your goal, you pat yourself on the back and you, you maybe pick a harder goal for the following week. And if you didn't meet your goal, you say, oh, that's in the past. I'm going to try again next week. So for four weeks, you have the opportunity to challenge yourself um, to make a change um, and hopefully uh, start a new habit. Uh, and, and then, as I said, it's also an opportunity to maybe find that thing that you like. If you've never tried yoga or Pilates, um, all from the comfort of your own home, um, to know what's best. And we will be identifying classes as seated classes or standing. So there, there really is something for everyone. Um, and we hope that a lot of people will participate. And we will also promise that at the end of the month to let you know where you can go to continue on. We're just not going to leave you cold turkey at the end of four weeks and say, <laughs> that's it. So, Okay. Well, since you called me out, Yes, I will do this. So I'm in. Okay, we'll do it together. <laughs> there you go. And and I mean, this is a, a remarkable opportunity. You're doing four classes every day, Monday through Friday, for the month, and there's no charge. And there's no charge. And once a class has been premiered at that time, it will go into a wellness library. So if you missed a class or maybe you went to a class and you loved the teacher and you want to see what else they did, you'll be able to go back and have access to that class. Um, uh, what we're going to do, do on Fridays is we're going to highlight maybe some classes. So people who want to do something over the weekend will tell you, hey, you should have checked out this uh, yoga and with that for MS, that, you know, it was a very well attended popular class. So yeah, lots yeah. of stuff. The, the, this is going to be an amazing event. So we, we, we've talked about the, uh, the presentations on research or wellness that happen every Sunday. Uh, people know what to expect and, and where they can learn new things uh, in the community expo. And then of course, there's a month long wellness challenge. Have, have we missed anything? You will see on the site the opportunity to sign up if you'd like to raise some money. Um, you can uh, ask people just like you would do for a walk. Instead of asking people to sponsor you for a walk, you can ask them to sponsor you to do the wellness challenge. Maybe that'll help you uh, keep going. And right now, the money that MS Hope raises goes to two places. It goes to um, funding social workers at um, MS centers that serve underserved populations and also to the International Progressive MS Alliance. Um, so we're funding research um, on progressive research. So if you feel like raising some money um, that'll go to those two causes, then uh, you're welcome to, to join. But certainly you do not need to do that. Uh, my, your first priority should be uh, focusing a month on yourself. Take your, give yourself the month of October to make your life a little bit Weller. I don't think that's an English word, but I just made one. <laughs> Fair enough. So, so how, how can our listeners attend Big October 2021? So you can go to um, bigoctober.org today and click on register now, and it will take you to our, obviously a registration page. 
Um, when you register, you'll have the opportunity to uh, register for the whole event, the expo, as well as register for the Sunday presentations you would like to listen to. Um, and then uh, October 1st, um, you'll sign back in. We're using a, a really wonderful platform called Cvents to host this. Um, so you'll have your own little attendee hub. So when you sign back in on October 1st, uh, you'll have your own little home page, which will show you everything you're registered for. Um, and then you'll also, October 1st, be able to choose your wellness classes and everything for the first week starting October 4th. So you won't register for those classes ahead of time. You'll do that that day. But BigOctober.org, not only can you register, hit the register now button there, but you can also see a list of all our instructors, um, the bios of our speakers, um, more information about the Wellness Challenge. So everything I talked about here, you can read about and understand better. And you can always um, email us at BigOct is our new Big October email at BigOct at MS Hope for a Cure um, if you have any questions. Well, fantastic. And I'll be sure to include a link to BigOctober.org in today's show notes. EJ Levy, I want to thank you for your continued efforts in support of the research that will unravel the riddle of MS. And thanks so much for talking with me today. Thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to spend a few minutes with you. The National MS Society is the largest private funder of MS research in the world, and they've just announced an $8.7 million investment in 29 new research training fellowships, early career awards, and other special initiatives, including continued support for the International Progressive MS Alliance. Now, what's particularly worth noting here is that all of the research projects being funded align with the MS Society's Pathways to Cures roadmap. Now, you might notice that we're using the word cure in the plural, and we've talked about this before on the podcast, but in case you're late coming to the party, we're saying cures Because depending upon who you might be talking to, the word cure can have different meanings. For some people, the word cure might mean ending MS, eliminating the possibility that someone could ever get MS. For others, the word cure might mean stopping all disease progression. And for still others, the word cure means restoring lost function. And the Pathways to Cures roadmap targets all three of these definitions. Stopping progression, restoring lost function, and ending MS forever. If you'd like to review the details of each of the funded research projects and see exactly how each is a step toward stopping progression, restoring lost function, or ending MS, you'll find a link in today's show notes. And if you'd like to see how all of this sort of lays out in terms of defining goals, identifying targets, and prioritizing the work ahead in developing Pathways to Cures, you'll find your copy of the Pathways to Cures roadmap under the Bonus Content tab in the Real Talk MS app. And if you haven't done so yet, I hope you'll visit the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store and download the free Real Talk MS app for your iOS or Android smartphone or tablet. It's the easiest way for us to stay connected. The app will automatically download the latest episode of Real Talk MS. You'll be able to save your favorite episodes. And as you can see, it's a great way for me to share bonus content with you. So I hope you'll take a moment and download the app today. When we talk about restoring lost function, We sometimes lose sight of the fact that when you're living with MS, physical function can often be improved, but that doesn't happen by itself. Joining me in a moment are two MS rehabilitation experts, Dr. Herb Karpatkin and Cinda Hugos, and we're talking about how to improve the mobility issues that arise early in your MS journey and those more advanced mobility issues that can arise later as MS progresses. In a moment, we'll meet my guests, Dr. Herb Karpatkin and Cinda Hugos. From the time you're initially diagnosed with MS, rehabilitation specialists can provide education and strategies designed to promote your health and wellness, reduce fatigue, and help you maintain optimal physical function. And when you think about maintaining optimal physical function, 
mobility is often at the top of that list. Today, we're talking about mobility intervention strategies for those people experiencing minimal walking or gait difficulties, as well as those who are dealing with more advanced walking or gait difficulties. And I'm being joined by Cinda Hugos and Dr. Herb Karpatkin. Cinda is a physical therapist and MS researcher at Oregon Health and Science University and the VA Portland Healthcare System. Cinda has over 25 years experience as a physical therapist specializing in MS. And for the past 10 years, Cinda has been focused on developing her research expertise, receiving awards for her research presentations at both the Consortium of MS Center's annual meeting and at ECTRIMS, which is the largest MS research conference in the world. Herb Karpatkin is board certified in neurology and geriatrics through the American Physical Therapy Association. And Herb is also a certified multiple sclerosis clinical specialist through the Consortium of MS Centers. In addition to being actively involved in patient care, Herb is a tenured associate professor of physical therapy at Hunter College, City University of New York. His primary areas of research are aimed at understanding and developing interventions that result in improved mobility for people living with MS. Cinda, Herb, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us. Well, Cinda, I'd like to begin our conversation talking about mobility intervention strategies for people living with MS who are experiencing minimal walking or gait difficulties. And I know that Sometimes even acknowledging early mobility issues can be tricky. Someone newly diagnosed with MS probably isn't thinking about mobility interventions. On the other hand, can you explain why it's important to address changes or difficulties with gait early on? Well, it's, it's always easier to prevent problems than it is to treat them. The, remember the old saying of an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. We may not know exactly what problems lie ahead, so we may not know exactly how to go about treating them, but we can start with the healthy basics of getting good quality sleep, getting adequate exercise, and eating a healthy diet. And people who do have notice some changes with their walking, they shouldn't ignore it. They should report it to their healthcare providers and investigate what is really going on. Is it MS related? Is it um, MS related in a something that is a come and go kind of problem or just comes on when they get tired? But they should investigate what the problem is so that they don't put themselves at risk for, for severe injuries. If someone ignores the signs of walking difficulties and chooses not to seek treatment, Does that decision have any effect on their future mobility? We don't really know, but any walking problems put people at risk for falls. And we do know that falls are can be um, problematic from minor issues of bumps, bruises, and scrapes to severe consequences of fractures, head injuries, and even death. So I think it's important to not ignore any walking difficulties. And unfortunately, the easiest ones to ignore are the ones that are not always present, that come and go, that you think have gone away, but suddenly they pop up again. Fatigue may be the most common symptom of MS. Can fatigue impact someone's mobility? It certainly can. One of the uh, kinds of fatigue that we see that impacts mobility is what's called nerve fiber fatigue. People may be able to walk normally for a short time, and then they notice that their walking quality starts to change. And then this is because the nerves are, the messages are not getting transmitted as efficiently as they were initially. And this can put them at greater risk for falls. There are other uh, kinds of fatigue in MS that can be a result of other problems. They could have fatigue from depression or fatigue from other medical conditions that would require their medical care provider to help them investigate that. But then they can also have the uh, fatigue the severe MS fatigue of that sometime called MS lassitude. And this is the kind of fatigue that is not easily ignored by the individual and often results in that person not participating in important life activities because they just, just don't have the energy. We want to make sure that all treatable causes of fatigue are optimally managed. And then we use strategies like prioritizing activities, energy conservation, cognitive behavioral therapy, and graded exercise to minimize the 
impact of the latter fatigue, the MS lassitude. Spasticity is also common in MS, and it can be as mild as a feeling of muscle tightness, or it can be so severe that it produces painful spasms. How can spasticity affect someone's walking or gait? Spasticity impacts the normal, smooth, coordinated activities of the muscles. So um, spasticity is stimulation that is normally, normally we, our muscles work when we ask them to. Spasticity causes the muscles to work even if we're not asking them to. And so the spasticity can, can be stimulating those muscles without our request and causing them to overwork or causing muscles on both sides of the joint to to work at the same time. Normally, one side works at one time while the other side turns off. And then when the other side works, that first side turns off. And that's part of that normal, coordinated, smooth action of the, of the muscle activity. And um, early on, spasticity might just be recognized as stiffness. So stiffness after prolonged immobility, after a long car ride, or after um, wake first upon first waking up in the morning. But certainly, if there is spasticity that's interfering with the normal, smooth coordination, coordinated activities of the muscles, it can interfere with walking. And how can it best be managed? Well, the cornerstone treatment for spasticity is stretching. Uh, stretching is the, as I mentioned, spasticity is continued stimulation to those muscles to work and muscles work by shortening. So stretching is applying the opposite stimulation or uh, applying an elongation moment to those muscles to try to help them maintain their normal length. Um, unfortunately, we don't know very much about stretching for spasticity, even though it's the cornerstone treatment for spasticity from early spasticity to late severe spasticity, we don't really know if it's effective. Probably the best evidence that we have that spasticity is effective in any condition that's in MS, spinal cord injury, stroke, or cerebral palsy is the results of my pilot study with about 40 people with MS and spasticity that showed that uh, regular daily stretching did seem to be beneficial. I'm now testing that in 200 people with MS and um, looking to see if stretching really can have an impact on people's uh, function and quality of life. There are um, medications, oral medications. There are injections such as botulinum toxin. And there are ways to deliver medications um, directly into the central nervous system that are all additional options for uh, spasticity management. For many people, their very first MS symptom may be optic neuritis. How can visual disturbances affect someone's gait? Vision is an, is an important aspect of balance. There are three systems that we use for balance. One is the vestibular system, the other is the visual system, and then the other one is the somatosensory system. Uh, the, vis the vestibular system is, is a slow system. It responds slowly. The somatosensory system is fast, but unfortunately, people with MS have numbness and tingling that may have impaired their somatosensory system so that they, at some point, learned not to trust it, even though they... Um, um, they may actually be able to trust that system. And so they tend to become visually dependent. They tend to rely on vision and maybe rely on it more than they really need to. They might tend to watch their feet when they walk. And so they've learned to, to be learn to become more visually dependent in addition to needing to become more visually dependent. When is the right time for someone to talk with their healthcare provider about a mobility aid? I think the, the right time to talk about, not, not so much about a mobility aid, but more about problems walking. So talk to their provider about any problems that they notice walking, and then investigate what is causing those problems. And certainly the first step would be with your primary care doctor or your neurologist. But then also, if they if you don't get adequate answers, you might want to see a, a physical therapist who has some expertise in multiple sclerosis to see if your walking problems might be related to MS. Sometimes those walking problems don't show up for several minutes or you know, 10 to 15, 20 minutes after walking. And so that short walk from the waiting room into the doctor's treatment room isn't going to display the walking problems that you might be experiencing in your everyday life. And you're going to have to bring that to their attention. And therapists can, can help um, 
uncover those more effectively than I think doctors typically can. Well, let's switch gears now and talk about managing more advanced walking or gait issues. Herb, what do we mean when we talk about advanced MS? The classical uh, definition of it is somebody whose MS has progressed to the point where walking is not something that they would use for any functional reason. They may be able to get up and walk a few steps with assistance, but their primary means of mobility would be to use a wheelchair or something like that. It refers to the fact that the MS has progressed to the point where walking is simply no longer viable. It doesn't mean at all, though, that these are persons who cannot be helped by physical therapy and exercise. And very often, it is the case that the way the patient presents as a result of the advanced MS can be improved, sometimes significantly, with the right physical therapy. Some people with MS have such severe numbness in their feet that they can't feel the floor or even know where their feet are moment to moment. Does this happen often to people with advanced MS? It happens extremely often, but I want to be careful about the usage of the word numbness. I very, very frequently see patients who complain about numbness in their feet. They say, I can't feel anything in my feet. In fact, what they feel is something called paresthesia, a feeling of buzzing in their feet, tingling. Sometimes they'll say it's like an electric a current is flowing through their feet, but they don't actually have an absence of sensation. And when I test these patients for sensation to see if they can feel my fingertip when it touches the sole of their foot or can tell when I'm moving their toe up or down, that their sensation, although impaired, is still present. And a lot of times in this case, their sensation is not impaired just because of the MS, but it's become impaired as a result of learned non-use. They simply stop using their feet, the sensation in their feet, to help them walk or help them move. There is a learned helplessness that occurs and Uh, there's a study that I'm in the middle of right now where we're taking persons with MS who have impaired sensation in their feet and having them practice balance barefoot so that they are forced to use more sensory input from their feet. And although the data we've collected so far has just been preliminary, it does seem that there is better sensation and better balance that occurs after training barefoot than after doing the same training with your shoes on. What types of spasticity might you expect to see in someone with more advanced MS or advanced mobility challenges? Generally, the, the spasticity would be, could be quite severe in an advanced patient. MS is a progressive disease by nature, and if they have minimal spasticity as someone with relatively mild disease, the spasticity can progress. And this really parks back to what Cinda was saying, that if they start seeing spasticity at an early stage, address it right away, start an aggressive strengthening program, excuse me, stretching program right away, it, it will not go away. So the spasticity in more advanced cases can be much more severe, um, but there should be caution with treating it medically too intensively. A lot of patients with a lot of spasticity when they have advanced MS have learned to use that spasticity to give them some stiffness in their legs to help them with transfers, help them with standing. And sometimes I find that some physicians will treat the spasticity, in my opinion, too aggressively and getting rid of any type of stiffness they have in their muscles. So the spasticity is gone, but their ability to use the spasticity for some functional meaning is gone as well. So eradicating spasticity and advanced MS may not always be the best, uh, the best way to go about helping the patients. Based upon some work that you were actually a part of, the National MS Society now recommends exercise or physical activity for everyone living with MS, regardless of their level of ability. How important is exercise for someone with advanced MS? 
I'm really glad you asked that because there is this, I think, very mistaken idea that once the person has advanced disease, exercise can't be of any help. And actually, quite the opposite is true. Exercise can be extremely helpful regardless of the status of the disease in the individual. Even in a very advanced disease, people who are in a wheelchair and unable to walk, working on improving cardiovascular uh, fitness by perhaps doing arm cycling or working on respiratory muscle strengthening can have a large impact. Persons with advanced MS tend to be, as a result of their disease, much more sedentary, and therefore their cardiovascular and cardiorespiratory health is going to be much poorer as a result. So for my patients who are dealing with advanced MS, I make them exercise very aggressively. I work a lot on trying to maintain cardiovascular and cardiorespiratory fitness. I also work a great deal with caregivers. I think that caregivers are an underutilized resource uh, for persons with MS. And I think physical therapists need to work harder to train caregivers, not just to show them what sorts of exercises can be done, but also to make sure the caregiver is safe, that they don't injure themselves doing the physical therapy and the care that the patients need. Um, as I mentioned to you before, it is not uncommon when I see a patient and their caregiver, and very often the caregiver becomes my patient as well because they've injured their back or their neck or their shoulder trying to do something which they weren't trained for. So the exercise program for advanced MS doesn't just include the patient, it must include the caregiver as well. Is physical improvement possible for someone with advanced MS? I would have to say without question. The improvements may not be profound. Um, it's not as if somebody who's been in a wheelchair for the last several years is going to get up and run the New York Marathon after a few weeks of PT, but it is certainly quite possible that somebody, and for, as far as I'm concerned, expected that they're going to improve in some way if they get the right therapy. But the key is they must get the right therapy in the same way that if somebody has MS, they're going to go to try to find a physician who specializes in MS. You need to find a physical therapist who specializes in MS, someone who has a clear understanding of how MS impacts movement and how exercise can be most effectively used to address those limitations. Cindy Hugos and Dr. Herb Karpakin, I want to thank you for all you do to improve the quality of life for people living with MS. And thanks for talking with me today. You're welcome. Great to be here. That's going to wrap up this episode of Real Talk MS. Real Talk MS is powered by the National MS Society. And you can share this episode of the podcast by letting your friends or family members know that all they have to do is point their web browser at realtalkms.com slash 212. You'll find that link in today's show notes, so you can easily copy and paste it right into an email or text. Don't forget to check out my new eight-episode podcast series, The MS Caregiver Conundrum. In this week's episode, we're talking to a remarkable couple, both of whom are living with MS, and each serves as the other's caregiver. You'll find the MS Caregiver Conundrum at mscaregiverconundrum.com, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, and wherever you find your favorite podcasts. I hope you'll give it a listen. I'm John Strum. Thanks for listening. Stay safe and make healthy choices.